Hi, this is Alex Burden, the Executive Director of the Truman Library Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's program, the inaugural event in an all new Truman Legacy series, Women Rising. Thank you all for joining us for what should be a fantastic event. I hope you enjoyed seeing those photographs that we're scrolling through. Those were fantastic and wonderful to see. Uh, we are honored to have with us tonight, Dr. Catherine Sharp Landeck, author of the Women with Silver Wings, the inspiring true story of the women Air Force service pilots of World War II. I also wanna thank our friends at the Martha Jane Phillips Star Field of Interest Fund for partnering with us to create and launch the Women Rising series. Their generosity will allow us to better profile the women who found their place on the world stage during the Truman administration, to reflect on their contributions, and to share their stories as a catalyst for promoting women as activists and leaders. The Truman presidency is three quarters of a century behind us. His presidential library in independence opened its doors to researchers 65 years ago. One could be forgiven for assuming that the stories and achievements of women during Truman's years in the White House have already largely been told. This is not so. President Truman's support of women's rights is a lesser known area of his progressive leadership. He voiced support for the concept of the Equal Rights Amendment. He looked to the day when Americans would elect a woman president. He signed into law the Women's Armed Services Integration Act enabling women to serve as permanent regular members of not only the Army, but also the Navy, Marine Corps, and the recently formed Air Force. This not only paved the way for thousands of women's military careers, it guaranteed equal pay, something civilian women are still fighting for today. Between 1945 and 1952, President Truman named 18 women to positions requiring Senate confirmation. Of these, nine were jobs women had never held before. Here are a few of those firsts. Helen Eugenie Moore Anderson, the first woman appointed to U.S. Ambassador. Bernita Shelton Matthews, first woman to serve on U.S. District Court. Edith Spurlock Sampson, first black woman appointed to be a delegate to the United Nations. Frida Barkin Hennock, first female commissioner of the FCC, and Anne Marie Rosenberg, the first woman appointed to serve as Assistant Secretary of Defense. And here's something I learned just last week. President Truman was actually interested in nominating a woman to the United States Supreme Court. This is three decades before Sandra Day O'Connor. However, he was discouraged from making the step the sitting justices were concerned that the presence of a woman would negatively impact their deliberations. I can only imagine what Bess Wallace Truman had to say about that. Still, this was a remarkable record for a president born in rural Southern Missouri in 1884. In fact, Truman installed more than 200 women in high level positions during his presidency. So notable was Truman's commitment to women's leadership, Adelaide Stevenson, the 1952 Democratic nominee for president promised to follow in Truman's footsteps in his, and I quote, growing reliance upon qualified women for high public posts. Yes, indeed, there are many stories yet to tell, and we are grateful to the Martha Jane Phillips Star Field of Interest Fund for helping us share the lesser known stories of women's history and achievements. So let's get to that. Let's get to the program. I wanna thank Catherine Sharp Landeck for being with us tonight and helping us launch Women Rising. Dr. Landeck is an Associate Professor of History at Texan, Texas Women's University, the home of the WASP archives, a Guggenheim Fellow at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, and a graduate of the University of Tennessee, where she was a Normandy scholar and earned her PhD in American history. Kate has received numerous awards for her work on the WASP and has appeared as an expert on NPR's Morning Edition, PBS, and the History Channel. Her work has been published in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and Time, as well as in numerous academic and aviation publications. To top that, 
Kate is a licensed pilot who flies whenever she can. Before I turn it over to her, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the program. You can submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Second, thank you again for joining us tonight and stay tuned for more fascinating programs in 2022. And of course, go experience the incredible stories, theaters, and high-tech interactives inside the stunning $29 million award-winning museum renovation at the Truman Presidential Library and Museum. That covers our pre-flight announcements and we're ready to take off. Kate, I'm passing the controls to you. Take it away. Well, hello. Thank you so much for your uh, very nice introduction. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm gonna just start the slideshow. Uh, thank you very much, Alex and, and uh, Morgan and Cassie as well of the Truman Library Institute. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for uh, your donors and the support that you're receiving for this story. Uh, I think President Truman is one that isn't often thought of when you think of uh, for advancing the cause of women. Uh, and I'm so glad to be here to help tell the story of some pretty amazing women and the part that he played in, in their story. Uh, now, I've been studying these women a very long time, the women Air Force service pilots of World War II. Uh, and I like to start my talks with this picture. This, this is uh, me uh, in June of 1993. This is at an air show, uh, the Biplane Expo in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I had a shiny new bachelor's degree in history. I loved airplanes. I grew up in Omaha, just up the road from you, and uh, had a chance to go to this air show, and I couldn't get anybody to go with me. I was working at a flight school in Tulsa. Nobody wanted to go, so I went by myself, which I highly recommend, uh, because then I got to do whatever I wanted. I got to go see whoever I wanted and, and hang out as long as I did, and at the very end of the day, I found out Curtis Pitts, who created the Pitts aircraft, the Pitts special, one of the coolest planes made, uh, was sitting in the shade of a hangar and was encouraged to go say hello. So I did. It was my day to be brave. Uh, and I went over and chatted with him. I was very sophisticated and said, Mr. Pitts, you sure make a neat airplane. I was very, very sophisticated when I was, was in my 20s. Uh, and uh, he turned and introduced a woman next to him, said, this is Carol Bailey Bosca. She was a 1951 aerobatic championship champion in my second airplane. And it blew my mind. I'd never realized women flew airplanes in the 1950s, right? You, everybody thinks of Amelia Earhart uh, in the 1930s, and that didn't end very well. Uh, and, and this was just so interesting to me, this idea of women competing in aerobatics in the early 1950s. And we talked. And at, I, I had my camera, right, my film camera with me. Somebody, I don't know who, took this very good picture, centered it up very nicely. And the moment after this photo was taken, somebody ran up to Caro there and said, you're Caro Bailey Bosca. You were a wasp who flew B-25s in World War II. And that was it. it it's not very often you, you have a photo of the moment your entire life changes. I had never heard of the WASP of World War II and talked with Caro about it a little bit and just couldn't understand why I had never heard of them before. And I decided that day uh, in June, 1993, that I was going to learn everything I could about these women and tell the story as widely as I could. So thank you to the Truman Library Institute uh, for inviting me and helping me uh, stick to that promise to myself and to these women uh, to share their story. And thank you to all of you for, for joining us. Uh, so I, just to get everybody on the same page a little bit, I want to give you some of these basic information about them, right? Just, just the basics of, you know, these women Air Force service pilots were all volunteers, right? All women who served in the military from the beginning of the time to the present are volunteers. Of course, all men who've served since Vietnam uh, are, have been volunteers as well, but, but every woman veteran you ever meet uh, was a volunteer who, who signed up to serve their country. 25,000 women applied to join this program, and I have to tell you, I 
when I heard that in the beginning of my research, I kind of thought it was made up, right? It seemed like such a big number. And Jackie Cochran, who I'll talk about in a minute and was the leader of, of this group, she she tended to make some things up, right? She, she exaggerated some things. And I thought, oh, Jackie, you know. Um, but then I went to the National Archives there in College Park, Maryland, and I found the letters. And these were women of all ages from all over the country, of all races, writing in on onion skin paper, farm wives from Kansas, and, you know, uh, lounge singers from Las Vegas, women of all types and all ages who just wanted to fly. Uh, only 1,830 were selected for training. Uh, 1,102 finally had their wings and served their country actively. Uh, they flew 77 different types of airplanes over 60 million miles in the United States. And I'll go into this a little further. Um, they ferried planes, they test flew repaired aircraft, they trained uh, men on the ground, they flew non-flying personnel, they were flight instructors, they did basically any job that needed to be done. And I think it's really important that, that everyone understands that 38 of these women were killed while flying for their country. Um, they, they, they were accidents um, and different problems with planes or with weather or whatever. Um, and flying was, as it still is, uh, dangerous. And, and it was in particular uh, in the 1940s. So now everybody's on the same page. You've got some basic understanding and we'll go further. The, the way I like to talk about these women is in uh, really lessons in perseverance, right? These women wanted to, to do this flying, they wanted to serve their country, and they faced challenges on the way. And the one advantage of kind of growing older with a topic, right, of, of spending 25 years working on something, is you really can get past the facts and get into what, what's the big story? What's the big lesson that I learned from all these years of doing oral histories? And, and you know, I, I was very privileged to get to see these women four times a year. I'd go to different events and spend time with them. And I really learned that they persevered, right? They, they pushed through, they, they worked hard for what they wanted and, and tried to make it happen. They didn't always get what they wanted. They didn't always win, but they always picked themselves back up and tried again or tried something new. Uh, and I think that's a lesson for all of us. Uh, and it certainly has shaped my life. Uh, so I like to kind of break it down into some of these different, different lessons in perseverance and places that we learned. Um, and one is learning to fly. Uh, this is Teresa James. Uh, she was one of the kind of leads in my book. Um, you know, it's it's all nonfiction, uh, but it's the story of 1,800 women, uh, and you can't do that without kind of focusing on some. Uh, so Teresa is one of those I focused on. I had the great privilege to know her. She was very smart and very funny, uh, and in the 1930s, she was very afraid of airplanes. She, she did not want to fly. Uh, she thought they were dangerous and foolish. Um, and her brother had been a pilot and had an accident, broke his leg, talked her into flying, driving him to the airport where she got to meet the other pilots. And she realized that uh, there were some good looking guys. You know, she's young, she's in her late teens. Uh, there were some good looking guys who hung out at the airport. So she started hanging out at the airport. Um, and they talked her into an airplane and she pushed herself past her fear and learned how to fly to the point that um, she was the first person to fly airmail out of her hometown in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. And she became a very prominent airshow pilot in the 1930s, making $50 a weekend uh, in the depths of the depression. So she was a uh, pretty pretty amazing and pushing past that fear. The photo, photo of her uh, with the young man, that's um, uh, Dink, um, that uh, she ended up marrying him and he went to serve in World War II as well, flying B-17s. Um, other ways that these women learned to fly, and remember, flying is very expensive, uh, but other ways that they learned uh, was through the civilian pilot training program. This is 
uh, a government funded program. They knew that, that trouble was coming with the war. They knew that we needed more pilots. So the federal government would tr train you to fly, uh, working through colleges and universities mainly, and uh, with the promise that you would serve your country. Uh, in this photo here, um, this kind of a, a awkward looking young woman here is Dora Dougherty Struther. Uh, and she learned uh, at the University of Chicago how to fly on, on taking summer school. Um, and then this other woman here is uh, Dot Swain Lewis. And she was one of the WASP who learned to fly with Phoebe Omley. If you're an aviation buff, you know, Phoebe Omley was a prominent uh, air show pilot in the 1930s. And she knew trouble was coming with the war and decided that women would be a good opportunity to train men to fly, uh, prepare them for combat. So she trained a group of women to be flight instructors for the Navy. And that's how Dot was able to learn to fly. And then she went on to, to serve as a WASP. And then they also were fighting to serve uh, and, and persevering. I've got the two leaders of the organization here, Jacqueline Cochran, uh, is, is clutching the propeller there. Uh, she was a very poor woman from Florida, uh, kind of reinvented herself uh, when she went to New York uh, and uh, was a hairdresser. Uh, but she wanted to own her own business and she wanted to fly. Uh, and so she did. She went out and got her license and then became one of the most prominent air racers uh, of the late 1930s. Uh, the other woman there is Nancy Harkness Love. Nancy came from a bit more privileged background, but worked very hard to learn to fly, uh, and then was a test pilot for uh, the Gwynn air car and uh, other aircraft. Uh, she did air marking in the 1930s. So these are both very prominent women uh, in the aviation field doing different things, but, but definitely in the same circles. Uh, and they both saw a need for women to serve their country, especially once the war began. Uh, as early as 1939, they were advocating uh, for the Army Air Corps and then the Army Air Forces uh, to allow women to fly and to serve their country. Uh, and they finally were able to push that through in September of 1942. Right. Uh, you have thousands of women who wanted to fly. As I mentioned at the top of our talk, 25,000 women uh, applied to train, uh, wanted to do it. Only 1,830 were selected. When you can choose from 25,000 women, you can choose the very best. And so they did. Uh, Jackie ran the training side of this program, uh, and she chose well-educated women, over 80% of the women had college degrees at a time when only 2% of American women had college degrees. Uh, they were all very healthy. They had to pass the same medical exams as men pilots did to get into the Army Air Corps or any of the military aviation branches. Um, and so they really were um, very serious about the quality of the women that they were gonna enter into this training. Uh, and then you have them going through all the same training that the men were going through. This was, uh, this was really what, what they called an experiment, right? I, I called it an experiment in the cockpit. Uh, there was one wasp be hated, who he hated when I called it that. She'd fuss at me and shake her finger at me. Say, oh, Katie, I don't like it when you call it an experiment. But that's what the Army Air Forces called it. They had it all through their documents. This was an experiment to see if women could fly. Uh, and of course they proved, they proved that they could, right? Um, and then once they had that success, um, they grew the experiment. They moved forward to see what else women could do. Initially, the women were brought in as ferry pilots. Uh, the ferry command was desperate for pilots. You think about the stories of World War II and all those airplanes that were being built. You know, think of Rosie the Riveter out there riveting the planes together. Well, those planes had to get from those factories to two points of embarkation, right? We were fighting in Europe and in the Pacific. So you had to have pilots fly those new planes from those factories to those points of embarkation and then shipped overseas. 
Um, initially, these women were brought in um, as ferry pilots, right? The, and they were called the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron. Uh, and Nancy Love ran this part of it. And then when those women who trained um, in, they first trained in Houston and then in Sweetwater, once they graduated from their training, they would move into the, the fairing squadrons, right? So it was one program with just two parts of the one program. Uh, but these initial women that were brought in, uh, that went straight into the fairing command, they all had a 200 horsepower rating on their, uh, uh, on their licenses. They had an average of over a thousand hours of flight time, really highly experienced pilots. And they were initially limited to very light trainer aircraft, PT-19s, um, uh, planes that were the equivalent of Piper Cubs, you know, just really small, lightweight aircraft. Uh, but they really proved themselves and pushed those limits and showed we really can fly these airplanes. Uh, and so they were put into these different fairing groups um, across the country and allowed to fly these different planes because they proved that they could. Uh, they went from these light trainer aircraft to, to the most advanced aircraft of the day, the P-38 there. Uh, this is Teresa James, who we saw at the beginning, the one who was afraid of flying. Uh, she was based out of uh, Wilmington and flew the uh, Thunderbolts, the P-40 Thunderbolts for Republic Aviation. Uh, and, uh, you know, all these planes all across the country, but, but the best and the fast aircraft in, in the country in the world, right? And then by the summer of 1943, so they started in the fall of 42, by the summer of 43, you have more classes of these trainees uh, that are graduating. And the Army Air Forces said, well, what else can these women do, right? We know they're successful as ferry pilots, but what else can we have them do? Where, where can we do them? Uh, and Jackie Cochran said, they'll do anything that needs to be done. And, and she actually called them aerial dishwashers, right? This is the work that needed to be done that nobody really wanted to do. Uh, and the women would be perfect for that is what Jackie said. Uh, so this is uh, the first place they expanded the experiment beyond just fairing aircraft. Uh, and this is tow targeting. Uh, and you can see this is Dora right here, the one who uh, learned through the civilian pilot training program. You'll see more of her. And you can see how old these planes are. This is at Camp Davis, North Carolina, which had a horrible reputation for really cannibalizing a lot of these planes just to keep them in the air. Because of course, all the new planes were going overseas as it, as it should be. Uh, but what they would do is they would tow a target behind their plane. And you can see this target here. So think of a banner if you go to a football game or the beach or something like that and and they tow a banner behind a plane that's essentially what they're doing you can see the pilots up here in the front and then in the back they've got a, a target man or a tow man and he would reel that target out and the women would fly up and down a line of gunners ground gunners who were learning to fly or excuse me learning to fire these would be 18 19 year old men learning to fire these big guns for the first time. And they would learn to fire at aircraft by shooting live ammunition, all color coded so they could see who was hitting the target and who wasn't right at uh, this target. So this is, this is dangerous work, but also fairly boring work <laughs> unless, unless things don't go well, uh, because you just have to fly a very precise pattern. And the, the women were very good at this. They were, were um, they knew this was important and they did a really good job with it. Right. Um, then they decided to expand it to other planes, right? Let's see what else they can do. And, and this idea of tow towing targets was a good one. So they've moved the women into more um, sophisticated and bigger airplanes. Of course, this is the B-17, the big four engine plane, which the Army Air Forces, when this program started, had no idea if women could do this. General Henry Arnold, in his final speech to these women when the, the last graduation said, I didn't know in 1942 if a slip of a girl uh, could you know, fly a four-engine plane, but you did. Uh, they trained these women to fly as first pilots in the B-17, and then they put them out, and you can see, you see the target here, 
uh, being towed. Because of course on the B-17 and other aircraft, they have gunners uh, that uh, are on the planes and have to learn how to shoot at, a, at a, another aircraft, right? To shoot the enemy airplanes. Well, that takes a little practice. The men on the planes would get three shots each um, and then they'd get shipped overseas. Um, but you have to have pilots flying these planes and flying these patterns together. Uh, and so women did this job. There were men who did it too, but they had this group of WASP uh, who did this job too, and they did, a, they did a very good job of it. Yeah. Mm. There we go. There's just another picture of that, a little closer up of it, All right? Now this is another job that um, doesn't get talked about very much, but I always thought was really interesting. Is um, these are P this is a PQ8. Uh, this was top secret. Uh, this is a friend of mine, um, uh, Lois Ziller. Uh, this is out in El Paso at Biggs Field out in El Paso, Texas. They were also in Georgia. Uh, training to this, and Dora actually learned how to fly this as well. And this was um, a top secret remote controlled aircraft. They would have equipment here in the cockpit uh, that a, a mothership behind them would be actually controlling this plane on taking off, but they would have a pilot in this, this remote controlled aircraft to take the controls in case there was a break in the, in the uh, production. Uh, and so the, this went pretty well. They did have one crash uh, and the woman broke her nose. Her best friend was flying the mothership and, and um, crashed her a little hard. So I heard this story, you know, 50 years later about you broke my nose and you have to buy me a drink. So it was a, it was a good hearted uh, conversation, but um, definitely, definitely um, uh, an interesting thing that of course has led us to the drones and the other aircraft that we that we have today. And the WASP were a big part of that. Um, and then this is another part of the experiment. You know, these women did did all sorts of jobs, right? They they did the towing of the targets, they ferried the aircraft, they um, were flight instructors of some of the men. They did they did all these different things. Um, flight tested aircraft after they'd been damaged. But this is one that I think um, fits the times pretty well. Uh, this is a B-29 aircraft. This is a big four engine uh, airplane that was built by Boeing. It was the first really pressurized airplane. It went to very high altitudes and it was essential to our war in the Pacific, really vital. Uh, this plane was first built during the war itself, right? This was designed and drawn just before the war uh, and then put together and test flown uh, during the war itself. Um, and it had some problems, right? The, um, the cowling is this piece around the engine and these four engines, the cowling was, was designed too tight for the airflow. Um, they had some new type of metal within the motor itself, within the engine itself. Uh, and it got hot uh, and there wasn't enough airflow going, going over it to cool it. Um, and so it had a bad habit of catching on fire. Uh, and there were some really bad accidents. There was one particularly bad one out in Seattle uh, where the most prominent uh, test, flight, test pilot for Boeing crashed. Um, it, was, it was really a, a horrible accident. And so it spooked the men who were supposed to fly this airplane. They did not want to fly it. They refused to fly it. They were not getting in the B-29. It was a killer and they weren't going to have anything to do with it. And the Army Air Forces said, yes, you are. We need this plane in the Pacific. And they tasked this man right here. And some of you may recognize him. Uh, this is Paul Tibbetts. So he was Colonel Paul Tibbetts at the time. Of course, he ends up being Brigadier General Paul Tibbetts. Um, but he uh, is the pilot that goes on to fly the Enola Gay, which of course is a B-29 uh, and dropped the bomb on Hiroshima uh, in 1945. Uh, but Tibbetts at the time was tasked with getting pilots into this plane. And they were just refusing. And uh, I had the great pleasure to know him 
uh, fairly well. Very, very nice man. And he loved telling this story more than anything else. He, he thought it was so wonderful. Um, he was tasked with, with doing this and he was sitting at an airfield, um, I think in Alabama and, and watched a plane come in in a very tough crosswind. It was an A-10 and this is a hard plane to fly in a crosswind and the pilot nailed it. And he watches a taxi up and out walks Dora. This is our friend Dora here who we'd seen earlier and out walks Dora. And he's like, there's my pilot. And he called over to where the wasps were staying on base and got Dora. And this is Dee Dee Mormon right here and said, you girls are coming with me. And I, I want to say Dora and Dee Dee are not large women. Neither is, is uh, Paul Tibbetts, right? Dora is about my height. She's about um, five, four and a half, five, five, right? So this is, this is not a, a giant group of people that are going to be flying this very giant airplane. And Tibbetts told them, I want you to come and fly this airplane. He taught them how to fly it in just a matter of days. They got their, their type rating in it uh, and they were trained in it. You see he's named it Ladybird after the women. And this is Fifanella. This is the wasp's um, uh, mascot uh, that came out of Disney Studios for them during the war. And uh, they spent two weeks taking this B-29 with Dora and Dee Dee as the, the pilots uh, around to bases across the country where the B-29 was based and the men were refusing to fly it. And they'd do a demonstration flight, then they'd come in and land, and the pilots would all run up and say, oh, who's the pilots, who are the pilots? And Tibbetts would say, those two little girls that just got out of the plane are your pilots. Oh my God, no way. Then the women would go up with the pilots behind them and the cockpit of the B-29 is huge. You can, you can have a party in there, it's so large. And so they would have the pilots stand behind them and they would demonstrate how to safely fly it because it was a dangerous plane. The engines did catch on fire. The engine caught on fire on Dora's uh, flight check, right? Um, the, the men weren't, weren't making it up, uh, but they demonstrated to them that it could be flown safely. Uh, and Tibbetts, Tibbetts loved the story. Uh, he'd talk about that, that uh, you know, we, we played a good trick on those guys and, and things like that. But the men appreciated it, some of the men. Uh, Dora received a letter uh, in the late 1980s from one of those pilots saying, um, you showed me that it was a good plane and thank you. Uh, they became good friends and you'll have to read the book to read get the rest of that story, but, but uh, it, was, it was something that was done with the B-25 uh, and other aircraft as well, kind of to play on the, the sexism of the time uh, and show that it's so easy to fly, even a woman can do it. Uh, so that's, that's one way that, that the WASP helped, helped with that, right? Uh, and then another place that they, they had to um, go forward uh, and, and is really a lesson in perseverance that I think we really all face, right, is learning to move on. Uh, when the WASP were brought into the Army Air Forces, first as ferry pilots and then as, as uh, other pilots, and their, their name changes in the summer of 43 to women Air Force service pilots uh, because there were men service pilots, right? They'd have the S on their wings. Uh, and they did the same type of work that the WASP did, right? The, the same, same jobs. So these were women service pilots. And the story goes that General Arnold liked good acronyms. Uh, so they added the Air Force in there. So they were women Air Force service pilots or WASP. Um, and when they were first brought in in the fall of 1942, the idea was these women would serve for 90 days and then be brought in as second lieutenants. Because this is what the Army Air Forces did with men pilots. They would, they would let them, civilian men could come, serve for 90 days, kind of a trial run, and then be brought in. Uh, but politics got involved with this. And what, you know, how do we, do we integrate the women into the whole thing? Do we keep the women separate? What do we do? And so the decision was made to bring them in uh, as a, a separate unit, right? The women Air Force service pilots uh, and keep them segregated as women, keep them with Jacqueline Cochran in control. 
of the women. Uh, and so a bill was brought before Congress. Uh, there was one in fall of 43, but really it's the spring of 44 um, that the push really goes forward. Um, and it doesn't go well. The military wanted them, um, but there were a group of male civilian pilots that um, were being released, right? By the spring of 44, uh, we had the extended fuel tanks on the P-51, which meant that you could escort those B-17s all the way to Berlin and back, which meant, of course, that the survival rate of our airmen in, in Europe especially was going much higher. So you don't need as many new pilots. So you have all these uh, male civilian pilots who'd been flight instructors who now were out of a job. Uh, out of their draft deferred job. They looked around, they see these women flying these planes and say, we can do that, get out of our way. Uh, so there was this huge campaign against the women uh, when they were, their bill was coming before Congress to become part of the Army Air Forces. Um, and the final decision on the bill came up, the final vote came up um, in June 1944, just a week after D-Day, uh, when everybody was feeling very optimistic that, that this, the war was going to be over, that we were really going to succeed. Um, and, uh, you know, the publicity against the women was that they were glamour girls. Uh, you could see how glamorous they are in this photo. Uh, that Jackie Cochran, that's her in this gorgeous color photo uh, of the time. Uh, that she, you know, was batting her eyes at the generals and uh, just just a lot of really bad press um, that that really does a disservice to the work that the women were doing, and their bill fails, uh, which meant they weren't going to be brought into the military, uh, but it didn't mean that they had to quit flying. Uh, that decision was made uh, later on in the fall, and they were finally disbanded in December of 1944. Um, and sent home. They were told, thank you for your service. We appreciate you, but now it's time for you to go home. We have enough men uh, to do the job and uh, you'll be replacing men instead of releasing them. And we know you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so the women had no choice. They had all these great skills and they were no longer wanted. Uh, so they went home. Uh, a number of them got married. Uh, this is Dee Dee Mormon right here, right? She's one of the two that flew that B-29 where she met a pilot during the war and, and they were married. Uh, this is B. Haydu, who was uh, in one of the later classes, but a uh, very prominent pilot in the group. Uh, she married another pilot and had kids right away. Uh, but a lot of the women were young and wanted to keep flying. Um, and so they did. So this, uh, you know, some owned their own businesses. Uh, this one uh, had a, a sky riding business and uh, flew. And you can see she's still wearing her Eisenhower jacket uh, and WASP uniform. So this is, you know, 47, 48. Marjorie Gray started her own um, uh, fixed base operation or FBO, uh, offering flight instruction and uh, aircraft renter, that kind of thing. Uh, others uh, kept uh, flying uh, through uh, air races and different things like that. Uh, but this was very expensive, right? To, to fly an airplane is very expensive. And uh, it was only the lucky, the lucky and the wealthy uh, that were able to do that. Others flew in air shows. This is, uh, this is uh, for the aircraft people in the audience. Uh, this is a JATO takeoff, right? A jet assisted takeoff. Uh, and the jet is strapped to the bottom of a WACO. Uh, this is Caddy Landry Steele. She was in class 43-7, went on after the war to get her PhD in English, taught at University of Miami, incredible. But this is, this is 1951, her doing a JATO takeoff in a WACO for the Jess Bristow Air Show. And this is Carol Bailey Bosca. This is the woman I met uh, that sunny day in June in 1993. And this is her pit special in which she won the 1951 aerobatic championship. So some of them wanted to keep flying, kept flying, uh, but most couldn't find flying jobs. The airlines turned them all down uh, and said, you know, 
we don't want you as pilots. Of course, there were thousands of men pilots coming back from the war. Um, so they didn't need women. Uh, they offered them flight attendant jobs or stewardess jobs at the time. And if most of the women said, uh, no, we want to be up front. Um, Jackie Cochran went on and uh, I, I always like to emphasize the fact that she became the first woman to break the speed of sound. That's her with her good friend, Chuck Yeager, who flew her wing uh, on her wing when uh, she did that. Of course, he had just broken it uh, a couple of years before. Um, and I think this is a piece that really connects to Truman and the things that um, the director of this institute that Alex was saying in the beginning, where President Truman really did make a difference in what these women were able to do. Because when they're disbanded in 1944, they were done, right? Some of them did uh, go and join the Women's Army Corps. Um, some of them joined the Red Cross. They wanted to keep serving their country. They wanted to be doing these things. And so in 1948, when the Women's Armed Services Integration Act passed, um, these women were able to join the military properly. Um, over 200 of these women, over 200 of the 1,100 women uh, joined the military, either the, the Air Force or the Air Force Reserves, uh, and served their country. This is Dora here, uh, who served uh, in the Air Force Reserves for over 20 years. Uh, she also went on and got her PhD in um, human engineering and worked for Bell Helicopter, breaking a number of helicopter records as a pilot. Uh, this is Teresa James, uh, who served uh, in the Air Force uh, and Air Force Reserves as well. Um, and then this woman here is Pat Payman, who um, doesn't get talked about nearly enough, I don't think. Uh, Pat went on and uh, joined uh, as soon as she could, right? As soon as she was allowed, thanks because to that um, Women's, Ar Women's Armed Services Integration Act. And Pat served as a WASP in World War II, as a, as a pilot in World War II. And then she served in Korea. She was called up and served in Korea. Uh, and then she served in Vietnam as well. And you can see in this picture, she's got her wings on. Uh, and she talked about the fact that she wasn't supposed to wear them. And she wore them anyway. And she dared them to take them off. Uh, because she'd earned those wings. She'd been given those wings by uh, uh, Army Air Forces General, and she was not taking those off. Uh, and Pat served, uh, her papers are now at the Air Force Academy, um, and she served with pride for, for, you know, over the course of three wars. Uh, so I think that is definitely um, thanks to, to Truman's efforts there. Uh, I do want to say this too. So this Dora here, um, great intellectual, and she served on Dakowitz, which is that Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Armed Services that uh, Truman pushed forward in 1951. Dora served on Dakowitz for many years, as did many other WASPs. They if you look at the roster of the women who served in Dakowitz in those early years, the WASP are very well represented in that. Uh, and they were very grateful for that opportunity to continue to serve their country in that way. And that's thanks to that tie of, of President Truman believing that they, they should have a voice uh, and then giving these women that opportunity. Um, now, one piece that the women fought for uh, in the 1960s and 70s was for veteran status because when they left in December of 44, they left as civilians because that bill didn't pass. Um, and they realized uh, in the 1960s, as Teresa was retiring from the reserves, uh, none of her time that two years she served as a WASP was gonna count towards her retirement. Uh, and there were other WASPs who were facing the same thing. And so they started advocating for themselves and pushing to be recognized as the veterans they were. They found an interesting ally here. This is, this is uh, Hap Arnold's son, Robert Arnold. But this here, um, you can see, is, is uh, Senator Barry Goldwater who of course was the father of modern conservatism, who was one of two senators who voted against the Equal Rights Amendment in 1972. And he was a huge advocate for these women pilots. He made this bill happen that 
ended up giving them status as veterans. And it was simply because he had served with them as a ferry pilot in World War II. He'd been with the Air Transport Command. He knew these women, the work these women had done. And he said, if I'm a veteran, they're a veteran. Uh, and he fought very hard to do it. And you can see in this picture here, this is Dora here. She testified before Congress uh, on their veteran status. And up here, um, this blonde up here, you can see is Teresa James, who was there um, all, all along the way. Uh, so they they finally got their parades uh, in 1970s. Uh, this is in Sweetwater, Texas, here in the 70s, uh, and finally got that recognition. Right, uh, the final fight and that final level of perseverance for the Wasp story um, was was all the way to the grave. Uh, this is Elaine Harmon. She was a good friend of mine. She was actually the first Wasp I did an oral history with in '96. Uh, and Elaine lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, wanted to be placed at Arlington National Cemetery as other WASP had before her. And when she died, Arlington National Cemetery said no. Uh, the WASP are no longer able to be buried here because their bill making them veterans uh, said they're veterans for the purposes of the Veterans Administration and the Secretary of the Army runs Arlington National Cemetery. Well, they hadn't met the WASP, and they hadn't met Elaine's family. Uh, I was very proud to work with Elaine's family um, and help write a bill in Congress getting these women back into Arlington National Cemetery. And we were finally able to place her there in September of 2016. Um, the service was fantastic, which if you could say about a funeral service, um, but, but we closed with singing, off we go into the wild blue yonder. It was, it was very emotional, but it was kind of a, the final fight, uh, the final moment of perseverance for these women. And their last moment of perseverance uh, was that of being remembered. They'd been forgotten for so long, for decades, um, and they decided they didn't want that to happen again. Uh, and in the early 1990s, they started looking for a place to keep their records, to keep their archives. And they made Texas Women's University, which is in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas, um, the home to their archives. I'm very fortunate to be a history professor there. Um, all the letters and diaries and oral histories that you can, can imagine are there. And there's also a museum out in Sweetwater, Texas, which is where most of the women trained, uh, which honors and, and remembers the women as well. And I will say, I hope that this next phase, this being remembered, um, the WASP are almost gone. We're, we have fewer than 20 who are left with us. Uh, they're all in their late 90s and over 100 years old. And I had the great fortune to know them and they tasked me with remembering them and sharing their story. And they trusted me, um, as I now trust you, uh, to help me uh, share their story as broadly as you can, uh, because I can't do it by myself. And these were extraordinary, extraordinary women who persevered their entire lives uh, and are great inspiration to all of us and should be remembered. So thank you for listening to their story. And thank you for helping me uh, remember them. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Kate, thank you so much for sharing these incredible stories with us. I can't think of a better way to start our Women Rising series. What, what incredible stories, what incredible women. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, if Thank anyone has so a question much. and they haven't added it to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, please go ahead and do so now. You can also like a question that's already been submitted that you would like to see answered. So we'll just dive in here. Our first question is from Frank. And Frank asks, what was the size, the crew size, as the women ferried the planes? So how many were on there at a time? Um, it depended on the aircraft, but usually it was a solo mission. Um, oh, you know, wow. the the pursuit airplanes, which the women ended up being the primary pilots of just because it, it was such a, um, a precise airplane and needed so much experience. Um, you know, the P-51, the P-38, all, all of these planes, the P-40, they were single pilot aircraft. Uh, so they would fly cross country, you know, the, 
P-51s and, uh, you know, from California or Dallas all the way to the East Coast, they would fly them uh, solo. Uh, now, if they did any fairing of the B-17s and others, those are two, two pilot planes. Uh, and so there would be the two of them. But, but for most of the planes that they were doing the fairing and most of the flying that they did was, was solo, um, solo flights. Wow. As, as captain, yeah. Incredible. Good question. All right. Our next question is from Richard, who asks about, you mentioned that there were 17 women who were killed in their service. Do you, do you know how many of those were killed towing targets or shot down? Yeah, um, it was, it was 38. Um, 38 of the WASP were killed um, in, in training and active duty. None of them were killed uh, towing targets. Uh, that's a that's a rumor that has been uh, has grown, and thank you for giving me the chance to um, correct it. Um, there were a couple of women who were killed at Camp Davis, North Carolina, which is where the WASP were towing targets, um, but they were on training missions. Uh, one was learning to fly night flight and and a familiarization flight, and she and the flight instructor crashed uh, because the plane. The plane had some serious problems, uh, and the other one, uh, the pilot, she had she had the army chaplain on board, um, giving him a flight, and um, and uh, she misread. They had navy planes and army planes on the base, and um, the the um, she misread. You know, one was in knots and one was not, and um, so, but but none of them were shot down. Excellent. All right. I, our next question here, I think is such a great question and I want to know it myself. Uh, Cordell asks, is there a searchable archive of the oral histories you have done or is that available to the public? Um, so my oral histories, hmm, I don't, I don't know. So I have donated all of my oral histories uh, to Texas Women's University. And, and that is a really great resource if you want to do some, um, more research on the WASP. Um, while the, the museum in Sweetwater is, is a great place to go and visit and see the space where they were and what, it, what the terrain was like. And, and the museum has built a new hangar and is doing a great job. If you want to do research on the WASP, uh, Texas Women's University is the place. Um, and if you go to their website, just twu.edu, and then go to libraries and women's collection and WASP, um, they've got a really great digital site um, with letters and diaries and some oral histories uh, digitized. And then I think it's over 20,000 photographs, uh, oh. which is so much fun. I have fun because <laughs> they're always adding new pictures and they get scrapbooks donated to them. And then they, they carefully digitize those photos so you can always find something new. And um, it's just so much fun to go and explore those things. So um, that's a really, that's a really good place to go. Um, if you want to learn more about the women. Excellent. All right. Our next question comes from Sharon, who first of all says excellent presentation and then Thank asks, you. did Truman interact with any of these women pilots? You know, I think that's a really good question and, um, I'm just not sure. I think, <laughs> um, I suspect that he probably did, just because I know that he had some conversations with the women at Dakowitz, um, and so I think it would be it would be post-war probably that he interacted with them. But I also know that he was a senator while all this was going on. So it it really um, I'll be honest, this opportunity to speak with you all and and uh, has has you know got me wondering you know did. Did they interact with him? Did he know about them uh, during the war years uh, in his in his uh, you know um, pre presidential role? Uh, so I, I think that's a great question, and I will be sure to let Morgan know uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's a it's a new piece of research for me, which I think is always fun to have have new questions to ask. So thank you for your question. Excellent. Our next question I'm going to ask from Pam. We have a couple that are really similar to this, so I think this sure. will be a good one. Can you walk us through what a typical flight was? Did they fly to New York? Did they do transatlantic? Um, walk us through. Yeah, I think so. It's It really depended on the job. And that's the thing about these women that was so fun for me is 
they all did something different, right? There was one wasp, Ruth Carney, whose job was to fly um, the chaplain on her base um, from base to base every Sunday, right? So she would she would take off and they'd fly to this base at six and this base at seven and this base at eight. And after the war, when, when I spoke to her, she said she didn't go to church for 10 years after the war because she got all that services in and she didn't have to go. Um, so, you know, and there was another wasp who, who was with the weather wing and they would fly up and they would, you know, you know, kind of like our hurricane hunters today, only they would go up and they would check the weather and, and um, do different weather experiments and things like that. Uh, but then even the ferry pilots, which I, I think is what you were really looking for, even the ferry pilots had very different experiences. Uh, there was a base down here, um, the fifth fairing group in Dallas, they had a lot of P-51s um, coming out of the factories down here. And so they would fly to both coasts, right? But usually the Southern route. Um, and, and it would be a long journey, right? And you'd have a lot of women out in Long Beach, California, who would uh, pick up the planes out there and they'd get up in the morning. And a lot of times they'd go in a flight, right? A group. So a whole group of pilots would go to the factory and pick up the planes. So there'd be five, six, 10 pilots that would all get their airplane and they'd all have the same destination, right? They'd, they'd usually just go a couple hundred miles. They wouldn't fly at night. They wouldn't fly in bad weather because these were brand new airplanes. Nobody wanted them to get messed up. Didn't care about the pilots so much as the airplanes, which were very expensive and very needed. So they'd, they'd, they'd scatter, right? But then they'd all end up in the same place um, and, and kind of following the same route. Um, and then you have, uh, Teresa used to tell the story, she was out at Wilmington and would take a, a quick hop over uh, to where the Republic um, aircraft factory was, pick up that P-40 and take off, and it'd be just a short flight to the New York Harbor, uh, where she'd landed, you know, 30 minutes in the air and land, and then it'd be pickled, right? It'd be put on a plane, on a ship you know, wrapped kind of in plastic, the oil drain, put on the ship and, and shipped to Europe. And then she'd get, you know, fly, get in the back of a C-47 or something and fly back to the factory and, and do the same thing over again. So it really depended on where they were based, uh, what aircraft they were flying, uh, how long they served, right? Teresa served uh, from September of 1942 to December of 1944. So she had a much different experience. She had one flight where she flew 30 days, right? She flew, delivered a plane someplace and they said, oh, we've got another one. You have to fly it here and you have to fly it here. And of course she didn't take extra clothes with her on that trip. So she has lots of good stories about cantaloupes in her knees with her pants. So um, it was really um, very different experience for every person, but I, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. Excellent. All right, our next question comes from Dan, who again says, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And then asks, what is one of your favorite wasp stories that you don't often get to tell? Ooh, that's such a good one. That's so <laughs> hard. You know, I think um, kind of about the beauty of flight, um, uh, uh, Vi Cowden, who was a dear friend of mine, she was the tiniest thing you can ever imagine. She would barely, she cheated to get in a little bit, right? She, <laughs> she's a very nice, honest person, but she, she uh, you know, was like five foot one, maybe 95 pounds soaking wet. And, 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 you know, she'd tell the story of she wanted in so bad. She, she hung upside down on the, she was a school teacher in South Dakota. And she hung upside down on the jungle gym to try to stretch her body so she'd be a little taller. And she ratted her hair, you know, to make her hair taller. And then she went and she was too light. So she, she left the doctor and spent the next week eating as much as possible. She said her sister was a great cook and she ate and all these milkshakes and then all these bananas right before she went in. And she, she weighed just enough uh, to to um, get in, but then she became a P-51 pilot uh, and just loved 
loved, loved that airplane. And she used to talk and it was, it was a love affair she had with these planes where, you know, she was the first person to ever fly that plane, the first person to get in it and take it off. And she said she used to practice landing on the clouds. You know, she'd, she'd fly up in the air and there'd be one puffy cloud and she'd come in and she'd swoop down and touch down on that cloud and take off again. And just the, the love she had for flying. I mean, it was, it was just, um, you could feel it. You could feel it when she'd talk about it. it you could feel it in your heart. Um, and, and I don't get to talk about her as much. Um, I, I don't know why, I guess it's my choice, <laughs> but, 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 uh, Vi's love of that P-51 and, and landing on the clouds and, and just how special that was. I, I love telling that story. So thank you. Thank you. I hope you liked it, but, but that's one of my favorite stories. Beautiful. We have time for a few more questions here. We have a question here from Don and He's asking about Pearl Harbor, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there is a Pearl Harbor story in the book. So he's asking, yeah. a flight of B-52s uh, were going to Hawaii. Were any WASPs piloting those? No, no, no. So the WASP, um, the WASP did not fly overseas. They didn't fly uh, to Europe. They didn't fly to, to Hawaii. They, um, they stayed within the continental United States. There's stories of a couple flying to Puerto Rico. Uh, which I'm still trying to confirm, but but um, no big open water flying at all. They they were kept within the continental United States. They almost flew to Europe, a couple of them, but it got squashed by General Arnold. Uh, the Pearl Harbor story that I think is significant. You know, the the Wasp started in September of '42, which of course is is a long time after. But um, in in uh, December of 1941, Cornelia Fort. Uh, who was one of these ferry, went on to become a WASP ferry pilot, uh, was a flight instructor at Pearl Harbor. She was right there at the airfield, a civilian flight instructor, and was actually in the air uh, that day uh, and was shot at by the Japanese and uh, then went on went to sell war bonds, telling her story. There was actually a second WASP who gets uh, forgotten a lot and um, her family lived there. Uh, and she was in the hills overlooking it and was good friends with Cornelia Fort and came down and they both decided they would do something about it and, and do that with their flying. So um, there is a connection to Pearl Harbor, but, but no, none of the women were flying, were flying for the uh, Army Air Corps that day. Good question, though. Excellent. All right, we'll go ahead and take our last question here, which comes from John. And he says, what an incredible story of another group of American heroes. What medals for heroism or other awards did any of the WASPs receive? Yeah, that's, that's a great, a great question. So they, um, you know, they got very few medals of recognition um, after the war. Um, when they did become veterans in the 70s, um, they, they finally got some of those, uh, you know, standard uh, medals. Uh, and then in 2010, they actually received the Congressional Gold Medal, um, which I, I should mention, I guess, sooner. So I'm, I appreciate you asking that question. Um, it was uh, signed in 2009 and then in um, this March of 2010 over 300 of these women went to Washington DC with their <laughs> families uh, filled the space um, and uh, they were uh, presented with this congressional gold medal which I cannot tell you how much it meant to these women uh, after after being sent home in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge and having to fight to be veterans and then their veteran status, you know, it was too late, right? They didn't get uh, the GI Bill. They didn't get uh, so much recognition. They got medical benefits, right? They could go to the VA hospitals. They got that flag on their coffin, which is what so many of them wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get that congressional gold medal uh, meant that they were finally kind of seen uh, for the work that they had done during the war, and, and it just meant, meant the world to them. So thank you for, for asking that question. Excellent. All right. 
Thank you all for joining us today. And again, Kate, special thanks. This was an incredible program, wonderful stories. We're so delighted you said yes and agreed to join us. And thanks again to the Martha Jane Phillips Starfield of Interest Fund for sponsoring this series. To learn more about the WASPs, you can purchase The Women with Silver Wings, the inspiring true story of the women Air Force service pilots of World War II, anywhere books are sold, including Rainy Day Books right here in Kansas City. This year's Wild About Harry Gala will be held on April 28th at the Muehlbach Hotel. Join us for an unforgettable evening honoring Harry Truman and raising funds for his presidential library. This year's honoree is William J. Burns, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. We hope to see you all there. To register or find more information about this exciting event, please visit our website at trumanlibraryinstitute.org. And don't forget, tickets are on sale now to visit the all-new Truman Library. Reservations are required in advance for all visitors. As always, members enjoy the benefit of free year-round access to the museum. To become a member or purchase your tickets, visit trumanlibraryinstitute.org. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>